Thank you for joining us for our online service here at Life Springs Christian Church. We are honored that you are tuning in, and we believe that God is going to use this in your life, in the lives of many others, in our neighborhoods, in our city, and around the world. At Life Springs, we want to experience God. That's why we create environments where we can connect with God in worship, grow with others in a group, serve together in ministry, and share God's love with those who need to experience Him too. If you are watching this, we would love to connect with you. If you would like to find out more about who we are, please visit us online at lifespringschurch.org. Thank you again for worshiping online with us. We pray you'll experience God with us today at the Springs. Good morning, Life Springs. Pastor Kevin here. I'm with my wife, Anna, this morning, and we just want to welcome you to church today. It's such a privilege to be able to share this with you today. Hey, if you are new, let us know that you're here. There is a button that says, I am new. Click that, let us know that you're there, right. and we will properly welcome you. Hey, friends who are here every single week, why don't you share the message today? It is a great message. It's the last one of the series. You can share that on Facebook, text message, whatever. Send it to your friends, your family, your co-workers. Share the message. Share our celebration. Absolutely. You know, today we're going to share in a time of communion together. Pastor Roger is going to lead us in that a little later in the service. Maybe this is the moment that you could prepare for that. Maybe you need to grab some some water, some crackers or juice or whatever you're going to use in your family and with the people that you're gathered with this morning to celebrate the Lord's table together. We're looking forward to that. It's going to be a great time. Hey, if you have kids, we have something for them. It's called SplashZone.org. It is for first through fifth grade. And my kids love it. Every single week, they're up at 7 a.m. asking to watch it. We're not even ready at that point. And then for students from 6th grade to 12th grade, there is something for you. The link is down in the description. Absolutely. This is a, a church for the whole family. And we're looking forward to what God is going to do through his word and through the teaching and through worship today. Uh, let me pray for you as we begin this morning. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this chance that we get uh, to be together listening and studying your word and worshiping together from wherever we are. We just thank you that our praises rise to heaven and give you praise. Help us be focused on your goodness, your faithfulness today, and we thank you for all that you're doing. And for every person who's watching right now, I pray God that you would use this service as a powerful moment in their lives where their hearts are turned toward you and their lives and our community and our world is changed because of what you've done today. And we thank you for it. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
the Lord church. Our God is good, isn't he? And his mercy and his faithfulness endures forever. That's why we say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I hope your heart is filled with that kind of joy this morning. You know, today I want to talk to you just for a minute about Hudson Taylor. Taylor was one of the most influential missionaries of the early 20th century. He founded the China Inland Mission, and before he died in 1905, he would brought over 800 missionaries to China. He began 125 schools, and because of his tireless work to share the gospel, he saw more than 18,000 people come to know Christ. I tell you this story today because even though he often faced hardship, difficulty, and uncertainty, he knew something about trusting God. He always had a plaque hanging on the wall in his home. And on the sign, it had two Hebrew words, Ebenezer and Jehovah Jireh. The first one means the Lord has helped us. Now, the second one means the Lord will see to it or he will provide. So one looked back while the other looked forward. One reminded him of God's faithfulness and the other of God's assurance. Praise the Lord. Aren't you grateful for those times when God was at work in your life? I know you can look back today and see all the ways or the times when you thought, I'm not going to make it. Bills are due. Family's in trouble. Things ain't going right. But you know that we serve a God who is faithful and who has always been working, even when we didn't know it. And I can promise you that when we take him for his word and we trust him, he says he'll be, in the fu he'll be faithful in the future, just like he's been in the past. And Hudson Taylor had complete trust that that's what God would do. Once in his journal, he wrote, Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced God. He knows very well that his children wake up with a good appetite every morning. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. I don't know if he's going to send 30 million missionaries to China. But if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. And then he wrote this. Listen to these words. This is what he said. He said, it de you can depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Did you get that? God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. And church, I'm so grateful to God that he uses his people to support his work. That's why I want to thank you for your support of the ministry here at Life Springs Christian Church. It's because of your generosity every week that we're able to reach out online, share the gospel of Jesus with people who need to know it. 
It's because of your generosity that we're able to connect with people and keep them connected with more of God's people who can grow in relationship with each other. It's because of your giving that we're able to help those in need as they present their needs to our church. And so, as every week, there are two ways that you can give here at Life Springs Christian Church. You can give online at our website. Uh, you can click on the button underneath this video. Or you can always uh, mail your tithes and offerings to the church office and drop it off here. Today, I'm excited about the opportunity that we have to give because I can't wait to see what God does next when you give. I know there are many of you watching right now who could shout with me this morning in celebration, the Lord has helped us. And I can promise you today that His mercy is new every day. You will never discover the end of what God can do. And I'm praying that the presence of God, the power of God, and the faithfulness of God would overwhelm you as you give and as you worship Him today. Yeah. 
faithfulness, God. Same as it is yesterday, today, right here in this moment, and tomorrow for all of eternity. We're going to continue to worship, but right now, whatever time you're watching this, whether it be Sunday morning or sometime throughout the week, right now, I want you to just, just give God a prayer right now, a prayer of, of thanks. And don't just say it up here, God, thank you for my health and for today, but be specific in your prayers. Let's just together, uh, and you guys too, together, let's just lift our voices and we give God praise and thanks for that you've done. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your, for your faithfulness. God, I thank you that even when I didn't love myself, I thought I wasn't enough. God, I thank you that you chose me, that you, you left their 90, that you came down to this earth to love me and to show me and to serve me, to show me how much you love me. God, thank you for loving me in a dark place and calling me so much more than that. God, thank you that you continue to show your faithfulness when I have been unfaithful. God, thank you for this church and for this family. I thank you for my brothers and sisters as we get to come together and to freely worship in this great nation. God, I thank you for this, for this nation, America. And God, I thank you that you continue to love and to show us who you are even when we're not worthy. Lord, we are not worthy, but all the time you are good. You are faithful, and we praise you here this morning. We praise you in this moment right now for all that you are, God. We thank you, and we'll continue to praise your name the same forever. Great is your faithfulness. Let's sing it. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me, God. Great is your faithfulness.
Hello, everyone. I want to thank you once again for joining us at Life Springs Christian Church, our online version. Uh, this is, I believe, week number 20 that we have not been able to meet together as a church family. And I'm really looking forward for us to being together again. And I want you to continue to hang in there. I hope you will also help us spread the word. And I hope you will share this message as you listen to it. Maybe post it online. Uh, put a link to it on your social media page. And and help us spread the word. I hope this will be very encouraging to you. Today we're going to wrap up the book of Colossians, and then next week we're going to kick off a brand new study called Love Thy Neighbor. And our pastor, Kevin Cotton, who was uh, on a previous video, would, is going to be here to preach that message. So, But today is the last part of the book of Colossians. I'm calling this message, Everyone Needs a Team. Now, when you first read this passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 to the end of uh, the book, the end of this letter that Paul has written, it, it, honestly, your first impression is that this seems like a very boring list of names and very personal messages from Paul and, and that don't, might not apply to you. And you're tempted just to skip over it. But don't do that because I, I want to tell you that when you look a little closer and you dive in behind the scenes of the stories of these men's lives that Paul's going to be talking about, these guys that are associated with his ministry, all of a sudden, this passage of Scripture becomes very interesting. And one of the first things you're going to notice is that the Apostle Paul, even though he's one of the outstanding heroes of the New Testament, he is always surrounded by people who played very significant roles in his ministry. He always seemed to have a great supporting cast of team players around him. Before we meet some of them in this passage, I want us to first look at the Apostle Paul himself. And I want us to consider the really powerful example he sets as the leader of the team. And we're going to learn from the examples of the the, the leader of the team, and then we'll learn from the examples of team members that surrounded Paul. But I'll begin in verse 18 where Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. This is Paul's way of saying this letter is personally and authentically from me. And I want to tell you, these verses contain some very personal messages. He addresses the church in Colossae and its members, but he also speaks to specific individuals. And when you read the whole passage, you're going to notice how the Apostle Paul affirmed people. So our first challenging example is to follow the Apostle Paul and be an affirmer of people. Be a people affirmer. You know, anyone can criticize, anyone can find fault, anyone can point out flaws. But the way to influence people to be their best version of themselves is with affirmation, not criticism. Just a few verses earlier in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul instructed the Colossians to let your conversation always be full of grace. Speak to people graciously. He says, let it be full of grace, seasoned with salt, flavorful, let your words go down smooth and, and easy and pleasing to people. And that's what Paul does. I want you to see uh, this example of how he encouraged people. He builds people up. He doesn't tear them down. Listen to how Paul is a model of conversation that is always full of grace. And take note of how P Paul affirms people. Consider this list. In this passage, he calls people dear brother, faithful minister, fellow servant, faithful brother, fellow workers for the kingdom of God, proven to be a comfort, hardworking, dear friend, and servant-hearted. You see, all these expressions of affirmation just in a few verses. Author Lloyd Ogilvie says one of the finest compliments that he's ever heard was paid to a friend of his. Speaking of his friend, someone said, he is an affirmer. When I'm with him, I feel good about being me. But more than that, I am encouraged to be the, all that God wants me to be. I love that. 
the kind of influence and impact an affirmer have can have is a, the influence to help others be all that God wants them to be. We do that with affirmation, not criticism. Friends, our relationship in Christ should be uniquely different than our associations in the world. The key to dynamic relationships in the fellowship of believers is that we treat one another the way we would treat Jesus if he was personally with us. There is no place for competition. There's no place for one-upsmanship. There should be no power struggles. We are to be servants of one another, to honor one another, and to prefer one another in love. And a mouth that constantly spews critical judgments and negative put-downs is a sure sign that one is not following the leadership of Jesus. In the verses that follow, you're going to get introduced to some of the key characters who are associated with the Apostle Paul and get a glimpse of how community is supposed to work in the body of Christ. Let's look to the next person in this passage of Scripture. Tai Chi Cus. Tai Chi Cus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. See, again, look at that affirmation. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances. So he's delivering very important news that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. So the second thing we learn here as an example to follow, Tychicus gives an example to be a dependable helper. He's the first person mentioned in this passage of scripture. We don't know a lot about him from other passages of scripture. Some suggest that he's the person who in Acts 20 verse four brought an offering to the distressed Christians in Jerusalem. In Ephesians chapter six, verse 21 tells us that he was charged with carrying the letter, delivering Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And these verses in Colossians, we learn that Paul considered him a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. So as someone who was trusted with the task of delivering money, the task of physically delivering the scriptures that Paul wrote, Tychicus was someone that Paul could trust. And so while Paul is in prison, which he is when he writes this letter, this is Paul's go-to guy. He was the person Paul could turn to when a job had to be done. He was dependable and reliable, a servant-hearted helper. And now that Paul is in prison, he turns to, Ty to Tychicus to deliver important words of encouragement to the Christians in Colossae. You know, we all want to have friends like Tychicus. Therefore, we all need to be a friend like Tychicus. Someone who is dependable, someone who's reliable, someone who's always trustworthy. That brings us to verse 9, the next example to follow. So Tychicus is coming, and he is coming with Onesimus. That's our next person. Our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. Onesimus. What we learn from this is that we want to be a circumstance overcomer like Onesimus a circumstance overcomer. I'm wondering, do you recognize this name? Almost one whole book in the Bible is about him. That's your hint. Paul wrote the shortest book or the shortest letter in our New Testament to an individual by the name of Philemon. And that book is all about how Philemon should deal with his runaway slave named Onesimus. How about that? So Paul's reference to Onesimus here is filled with grace because Onesimus was the runaway slave that belonged to Philemon. And Philemon is a member of the Colossian church. However, Paul does not refer to Onesimus as a slave but as a faithful and dear brother. Now, here's the backstory. Evidently, Onesimus had reached Rome in his flight. And what, once there, he runs into the apostle Paul. In fact, Paul may be even the one that led Onesimus to the Lord. 
So once a runaway slave, now Onesimus finds the love and acceptance of the fellowship of believers in Christ. He finds the brotherhood of of Christians there in Rome. And the New Testament letter called Philemon is Paul's appeal to this slave's owner regarding this slave named Onesimus. Paul wrote the slave owner Philemon, who is also a Christian, and appealed for him to forgive Onesimus, especially now that Onesimus is not just his slave anymore, he's become his brother in Christ. In fact, Paul urged Philemon to receive Onesimus back, not merely as a slave any longer, but because he is your brother. Paul knew that neither Onesimus nor Philemon are going to grow to spiritual maturity without being reconciled. Onesimus may have needed to make restitution, and Philemon had to express the Lord's forgiveness. Now, at one time or another, we have all been Onesimuses, or we've all been Philemons. And I mean by that, we have all been in the position of needing to ask for forgiveness for what we've done wrong. And we've all been in the position of needing to extend grace and forgiveness to someone who's wronged us. It's not easy to seek forgiveness, and sometimes it's not easy to extend forgiveness. Listen to how Onesimus overcame his circumstance as a runaway slave who all of a sudden found himself among the community of Christians in Rome. Consider this from the words of Paul written to Philemon about Onesimus. Paul writes, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. Perhaps the reason he was separated for you for a little while is that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me and even dearer to you. Welcome him as you would welcome me. Wow. Paul says, welcome this runaway slave the way you would welcome me as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is such an affirmer. So Philemon had a runaway slave, but Onesimus didn't stay in that circumstance of shame and as a fugitive. He became a personal helper and friend to the great apostle Paul. Onesimus was also the offending brother who needed to make things right. And with Paul's help, he overcame the fears of his circumstance. He returned to his former master, now a brother in the Lord, And Paul appealed for their reconciliation and Philemon's forgiveness. Onesimus' life story is a a story that it tells us it doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were born on. It, It doesn't matter what your heritage was. Because by the grace of God, you can overcome all those things no matter what the past has held for you. By the grace of God, you could overcome those things and be someone significant in the family of God. Here's a former slave who is Paul's dear helper. That brings us to verse 10. Verse 10 and 11 says, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. So the fourth example here to follow is Aristarchus. He's an example of someone who is a persevering supporter of Christians in ministry. A persevering supporter. According to Acts 19, verse 29, Aristarchus was from Macedonia and one of the Apostle Paul's traveling companions on his missionary journey. He is mentioned specifically as one of those who endured that riot in Ephesus recorded in the book of Acts. And so he put his life on the line for the sake of the gospel along with Paul. 
According to Acts 27, verse 2, when Paul was on trial and appealed his case to Caesar, Aristarchus was on the ship with Paul that set sail for Rome. This meant that Aristarchus was also someone who experienced that fierce storm that led to a shipwreck, which Luke, the author of Acts, describes in great detail in Acts 27. Now Aristarchus is continuing to voluntarily, voluntarily stand by Paul's side during his imprisonment in order to help and comfort his friend, the Apostle Paul. Are you getting a picture of the kind of friend Aristarchus was? Aristarchus was a loyal and persevering supporter of the Apostle Paul. No matter how difficult the trials were, a ride in Ephesus, a shipwreck on a, in a, because of a violent storm, now imprisonment, therefore Aristarchus stands out as one of the greatest of Paul's helpers. He hung in there when the going got tough, and he was willing to suffer himself in order to support Paul in his ministry. That brings us to a fifth example and that's found in the next part of that verse, the second half. Mark, I want you to understand, this Mark is also called John Mark in Scripture. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, this is the first time we learn about this relationship, although we've heard about this guy before. He's Barnabas' cousin. He says, you have received instruction about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. So, the example we have from this character, Mark, is to be a comeback maker. Be a comeback maker. We're introduced to John Mark as a companion of Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 12, verse 25, it says, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. All right. And then Acts chapter 13. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. John, this is John Mark, John was with them as their helper. So that's his role. He's become a helper to these two missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. Acts 13, verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Pergia in Pamphylia, where John left them. This is a real key event right here. Where John left them to return to Jerusalem. We're not told specifically why John left why he quit halfway through the journey. Maybe he was homesick. Maybe he was too young and a bit wimpy and couldn't handle the hardships of missionary life. Maybe he was experiencing culture shock as a young Jewish man and he couldn't handle life among the Gentiles. Whatever the reason, he let Paul down. Paul was gracefully disappointed in, in, in John Mark. He really considered him a quitter right in the middle of the missionary journey. In fact, Luke, who writes the book of Acts, describes John Mark as someone who had deserted them. We'll see that in a moment here in Acts 15, beginning in verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back. This is another missionary journey. Let's go back and visit the brothers and in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So this is a follow-up trip. We're going to revisit some of the same cities where churches were planted. And Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, his cousin now. He wants to take his cousin, John Mark. But Paul did not think it wise to take him. And here's what, how Luke describes Paul, Paul's feelings for sure, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. This passage goes on. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Paul and Barnabas, I mean, these two friends and co workers who had gone through and endured so much, got so 
entrenched in each of their own positions over John Mark that they could not come to an agreement. They couldn't even agree to disagree and continue to work together. Their disagreement was so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And so these two missionaries go separate ways, all because of that previous failure of John Mark. Friends, I want you to understand, everybody fails. Everybody fails. We're all going to fail, so we all need to learn to fail forward. John Maxwell, who literally wrote the book on falling forward, says, or, yeah, falling forward, failing forward is the ability to get back up after you've been knocked down. Learn from your mistake and move forward in a better direction. That's the way we need to treat failure. We need to learn from it, get ourselves back up off the ground, and go in a better direction. By the time Paul writes the letter to the Colossians, John Mark has already made his comeback. Mark is serving at Paul's side as one of those people who has been a comfort to him during his imprisonment. The good news I want you to see here, Mark failed early on, but he didn't let defeat and failure define him. Near the end of Paul's life, this is what Paul says about Mark in the book of 2 Timothy, very late in Paul's life. In chapter 4, verse 11, only Luke is with me. And, and he's telling Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in ministry. Not a deserter anymore, not someone I don't trust anymore. Man, he is someone I can depend on. He is a helper to me in ministry. What a great testimony. No longer a failure, no longer a deserter, a faithful helper. The difference between a failure and someone who is successful is not so much that one failed and the other did not. It's the fact that one had the courage after failing to get up and try again. One had the courage to get up and attempt a comeback while another person lets failure define them and gives up. William Ward says, failure should not be our teacher. Or excuse me, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. It is a delay, not a defeat. It is a temporary detour, not a dead-end street. So be a comeback maker. That leads us to our sixth example, which we find in verse 12. Epaphras who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. We learn from his example that we need to be a prayer warrior. Be a prayer warrior. He prayed constantly. If you've printed out your sermon notes that are posted online, then I would have you... Uh, circle the word always. He's always in prayer for you. And then if he prayed fervently. Under the, underline the word wrestling. The word here means agonizing. He is wrestling with God in prayer over you. He's agonizing over you before the throne of grace. This Greek word describes a dedicated athlete fully giving themselves to the sport. Epaphras was someone who poured out his heart to God in prayer, and he's praying continually for you, Paul says. And he prayed fervently, and he prayed personally. In verse 12, circle the words, for you. He prayed specifically for the people of these three churches. He didn't pray, bless all the missionaries, be with all the Christians in all the churches. He didn't pray just general prayers for everyone, but no one in particular. He focused his intercession on three churches, the Colossian church, the Laodicean church, and the Hierapolis church. No doubt he mentioned some of them by name in his prayers. Epaphras was not an impersonal uh, prayer going through religious motions. He carried these people in his heart 
And he prayed for them and lifted them up to God personally. And he prayed specifically. Three expressions summarize his intercession for the Christians. He prayed that they would be full grown, completely filled, and, and all in all of God's will. He prayed that they would be full grown, completely filled up with all of God's will. Essentially, that they would continue to grow, that they would make progress in everything that God wanted them to be. We move on to example, another example. This is also by Epaphras, but our, our seventh thing that we want to learn is from this verse. I vouch for him, this is still Epaphras, that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Be a hard worker. Be a hard worker like this man. You know, in the previous chapter, Paul instructs uh, the Colossians on the proper work ethic for those who are following Jesus. He said in Colossians 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as is working for the Lord, not men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. So be a hard worker. Being a hard worker, friends, is a Christian value. It's a characteristic of a true Christ follower, a good work ethic. And Epaphras did that. He was a hard worker. That brings us to verse 17. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. See to it that you complete the work. We learn from Archippus that we need to be a race finisher. You know, you and I are all on a mission from God. We all have work to do in this kingdom. So how are you going about your work? Are you still focused on completing your mission? Some of us have roles that put us in the spotlight. Others of us have roles that put us behind the scenes. Some of us will be frontline evangelists. Some of us will be behind the scenes prayer warriors. Some of us will be peacemakers. And others, others of us will need to go the second mile to forgive and to be reconciled. But we all have a job to do. We all have a contribution to make. We all need to run the race with perseverance. I close with this story. In the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, British sprinter Derek Redman was the favorite to win the 400-meter race. When the starting gun sounded, he got off to a great start, but disappointment came 150 meters into the race when he tore his hamstring. He hobbled a few more meters in pain, but then fell to the ground in agony. Medical staff began to gather around him. The stretcher bearers were arriving onto the scene, so he knew he had a decision to make. Give up and be carried off, or get up and finish the race. Give up or get up, even though he could never win the race. Despite the pain, he pulled himself up off the ground and began to hobble on his one good leg, trying to finish the race. And suddenly, a man came out of the stands, out of a crowd of 65,000 fans in the Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, Spain. This man pushed past security, came right onto the track, and continued to push security away, running to catch up with Derek, and he caught up with him from behind. It was Derek's dad. And his dad said, son, you don't have to do this. And Derek exclaimed, Yes, I do. So his dad responded, well, then we'll finish this race together. He put his arm around his son. Son put his arm over the shoulder of his father, and they continued the race together. And that's our message today, is that let's finish the race together. His dad helped to balance Derek, as he hobbled toward the finish line, the crowd of 65,000 people, once they realized what was going on, stood on their feet cheering, giving them a standing ovation. And just shortly before the finish line, the father let go of his son so that Derek could cross the finish line on his own. Derek Redmond may not have finished the race in first place, 
but he finished his race. Despite the tears, despite the pain, he was determined to cross the finish line. And someone who loved him was there by his side to help him finish the race. Friends, I dare say that none of us, this pastor included, are as spiritually mature or as spiritually wise as the Apostle Paul. None of us are more filled with the Holy Spirit than the Apostle Paul was. And friends, if the Apostle Paul needed a team around him to help him finish his race, then you and I definitely need to be on a team. We need a team of players around us. God has wired you up to make an important contribution to the body of Christ so that you can help someone else finish the race. There's someone in the body of Christ who needs you to be a people affirmer. There's someone in the body of Christ who needs you to be a dependable helper. There's someone in the family of God who needs to be inspired by your testimony of being an overcomer. There's someone in the family of God who needs you to be their persevering supporter. There's someone in the family of God who needs to be inspired by seeing you fail forward and making a comeback in spite of the failures of your past. There's someone in the family of God who needs you to be their prayer warrior, to intervene in prayer in the spiritual realm on their behalf. There there is a ministry in the church that needs you to be one of those hard workers carrying out the ministry. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who need your encouragement, friends, so that they can be race finishers. Let's finish together. We're going to close our time together this morning by meeting around the Lord's table and participating in communion together. I hope that you prepared the little maybe piece of bread and a cup of juice, a cracker or some wine. But I want you to notice how simple the symbols we use for this meal I have here just a small cracker and a small amount of fruit juice. Notice the communion meal is really simple. It was intended to be the kind of meal that any peasant in the first century could afford to enjoy. Think about these things, these symbols, how humble they are. This is a humble meal designed for humble people. Despite our desire these days to present the bread and the juice in gold trays decorated with crosses, the original thought was to participate in the simplest, humblest, plainest meal possible. In fact, the original Passover meal thousands of years ago took place in Egypt. It was a meal for poor slaves who had been in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years. It's not like they had much, nor could they afford much, but they could afford a little unleavened bread and wine. Communion is a time for humble people to acknowledge the greatness and the goodness of an almighty God. Communion is a time for us to humble ourselves before a holy God, owning up to and confessing our sin to him. Communion is a time for humble people to humbly surrender their lives to the leadership of Jesus afresh. Communion is a time for humble people to offer themselves as living sacrifices to the service of Christ. Communion is a time for humble people to repent of any attitudes of superiority towards other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. No attitude of superiority can stand because the cross reminds us that the ground is level at the foot of cross. And so communion should remind us to be humble and to recognize that we would not have any standing with God, not a single one of us 
were it not for the complete and total grace of the Lord Jesus and his blood shed for us at the cross. Yes, we need at communion time to humbly acknowledge that brothers and sisters around us all come to the level ground around the cross. At communion time, we humbly acknowledge that we were made by God to need one another. None of us is a solo Christian. None of us is intended to fly solo through the Christian life. We were designed by God to need one another. So together, corporately, we are members of one body. We have many differences. We differ in age. We come from different generations. We come from different backgrounds. We come from perhaps different races, racial backgrounds. We come from different economic backgrounds. We have different spiritual gifts. We have different political views. But we are one body, the church. So we come to communion time and humbly commit ourselves to preserving the unity that Jesus went to the cross to give us. So at this communion time, humble yourself before the Lord. The piece of bread is Christ's body just broken for you, a sacrifice to pay the penalty that your sins and my sins deserved. He gave his life, gave his body to be nailed to a cross so that you and I could be right relationship with God. And we think of the cup, which represents his shed blood. And because of his shed blood, it doesn't matter how dark our sins are. It doesn't matter how many skeletons might have been in the closet of our past. The blood of Jesus covers every sin. His grace is greater than our worst mistakes. So take the cup and drink it. And remember, and Jesus willingly laid down his life to pay the price for your sin and mine. Oh Lord, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for coming to our rescue we thank you for paying the ransom paying the debt that we could never pay and thank you for the new life that's ours and Lord we humbly acknowledge that we are sinners in desperate need of your grace we humbly acknowledge that we fall short of the glory of God and we need to walk and follow Jesus more closely. And we humbly acknowledge that we're not better than anyone else in the body of Christ. Not anyone. Lord, I pray that all of us would have the attitude that because everyone matters to you, everyone matters to us. Lord, I pray we would take that humble approach and turn the world upside down with love and humble service. This is where our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's finish the race together. God.
solid ground The nations rise and fall Kingdoms once strong now shaken We trust forever in your name The name of Jesus You're unmatched in all your wisdom, Lord. Let's sing. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign. And every knee will bow. our banner high for you, Jesus, your name. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Well, praise the Lord, church. What a great message and what a great time in communion this morning. You know, there's a lot of ways that we could respond to God's word today, reminding us that every one of us needs a team. We need those people who are going to gather around us, come alongside us, so that we can make it across the finish line together. You know, a lot of ways that you can respond. One of those is by getting involved in a life group here at Life Springs. You know, I love our life group and I cannot wait until we start meeting again regularly at the end of this month. You do not have to wait to find a group. You can go online right now and you can look through the groups and you can see if there's one that fits you. Absolutely. There's going to be all kinds of groups uh, this fall. There's going to be groups that meet online only. There's going to be in-person only groups. There's going to be some blended groups that do some of both. And I want you to be able to find a group that fits you where you can grow together with God's people. You know, it's been a great morning. I'm just excited about this message and this time that we've shared together. You can still share this with somebody. You know, it's available all week long. And I know that there's somebody who will benefit from your sharing on Facebook, sending a message, whatever it means. But I can tell you, somebody needs to know that God loves them, that we care about you, and that we're praying for you this week. Have a great Sunday. God bless you. Hey guys, I'm Mark. I'm the Children's Director here at Life Springs Christian Church. We're so excited and glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us. We have a lot of really fun and cool things for your kids. 
and it's all on the internet over at splashzone.org. Go to any web browser on your phone, on a tablet, on a computer, however you like, and uh, head over to splashzone.org, and we're going to have exciting Bible verse games for your kids, a Bible story, there's going to be an art challenge for your kids, and of course, what kids program would not be complete without a puppet? So it's all happening over at splashzone.org. We hope you can join us, and we're just so grateful that you're here worshiping with us today. God bless. Hey, my name's Darren. I'm the student director at Life Springs Christian Church. And if you have a sixth through 12th grader, we would love to meet them and get to know you guys as well. The best way to stay informed of the things that are going on here at Life Springs and the Impact Student Ministry is simply to text the word Impact Student to the number 84576. And from there, you'll, you'll get to know our online weekly meeting times, uh, some of our links to our YouTube channels to have some daily de devotionals where your students can engage in some of that on demand when it's good for them. Hey, we hope that we're gonna have some in-person things coming up during the summer, late summer, and into the fall as we'll see what happens with our coming school year here in Las Vegas. Hey, we love you guys. I would love to meet your six or 12th grader. Hope to hear from you soon. Have a great week.